Yeah, welcome. My name is uh, Georg Fierzer. I'm a research lecturer of the department here, um, but I'm not a nuclear physicist, so my disclaimer, nothing I tell you today will be in any way uh, secret or, or, or forbidden or whatever. Nothing what I say will get you, you or me into jail. Um, I'm a particle physicist. So, if you talk about the physics of the, uh, of, the, of the bomb, we need to understand first a little bit about the physics of the nucleus. So um, the first thing I want to do is just introduce to you who is actually a player in the nucleus. And so we'll start with the proton. The proton has a positive charge and is obviously required um, to balance the negative charge of the electrons. Yeah? Um, we know about the proton for a fairly long time because of this charge argument, and actually the first person to to show that there are these things like protons was Rutherford, and this is 1917. Um, just for, for, for future use, um, we will use the letter Z to tell us how many of those protons will be in a, in a nucleus. And the other big player is the neutron. Neutron, as it says in the name, is electrically neutral. Um, took us much longer to sort of uh, understand the existence of the neutron, um, and it was confirmed in 1932 as a free particle uh, by a, a British uh, um, physicist, Chadwick. Again, we use a letter to count the number of neutrons in the nucleus. We call this N, and to both to, together um, are what we call the mass number, and we, we write this with the letter A. Now, one thing to note is, oh yeah, we call these two the nucleons, and these are the particles which are inside the nucleus. Um, and one thing to notice, which is very interesting and, and has huge repercussions for the, the world we are living in, is that apart from the charge, these two are actually very, very similar. Yeah? Um, for example, they have the same size, they have very similar mass, so all its properties are very similar. Um, contrary to the electron, which is very different. Yeah? Um, it's much, much smaller than the protons and the neutrons. Um, now, because they are so similar in, in, in properties, uh, they can easily change into each other by a process which we call beta decay. So the next thing we want to understand is what keeps those protons and neutrons together in the nucleus. Uh, it cannot be electromagnetism because we are binding a neutral particle. Um, it also cannot be gravity because gravity is too weak. So none of our existing easily recognizable forces are of any relevance here, and we have to actually introduce a new force, a nuclear force. Nuclear force is fantastically difficult. Yeah? Not even our undergraduates really learn uh, uh, how to deal with that one, and, and, and even very advanced physicists cannot really deal with it in a, in a good way. Um, but um, for the discussions here, I will use two very simple features. The first one is the fo this nuclear force doesn't distinguish between protons and neutrons. It treats them absolutely the same. Yeah? Um, the second thing is that uh, this force keeps two nucleons always at a fixed distance, or very much close to a fixed distance. And that distance is around two femtometers. Yeah? So just to give you an idea how much this is, um, this is when you write it in meters, you have 15 zeros. And to give you a scale, after six zeros, you hit the size of a human hair. Um, after another about uh, three to four zeros, you've hit the size of a, of a soap film. Um, then after 10 zeros, you hit the size of an atom. And then finally, you get to the dimension of, of, of these nuclear interactions, um, which is uh, about five orders of maybe smaller than the size of an atom. But because of the fact that um, the, this nuclear force likes to keep these forces at exactly that uh, distance, it is actually useful to come up with an image where we um, treat these two as, as spherical hard balls, which stay in contact with each other. And then when you sort of, in, sort of uh, spin this thought further, if you always have the same distance, then you can build up a whole nucleus out of lots of these little balls, and they're all in touch with each other at a scale of two femtometers. So 
The main thing now for any nuclear energy, where is it coming from? The nuclear energy comes from the binding energy of these nucleons. So um, what we will find is we will have a nucleus with a lower binding energy, something happens to it, and it will change into a nucleus with a higher binding energy. And the difference between these two binding energies is the gain we get in terms of nuclear energy. So now I will drag you to, through the only equation I give you tonight, um, which is an equation which tries to, to, to parameterize how this binding energy is now, is now sort of, uh, how it's made up of various contributions. So we will build an equation, and we'll also look at what this equation actually says in this kind of diagram. In the diagram, we will show the binding, oops, so that, no, somehow doesn't work. So we'll show the binding energy as a function of the size of the nucleus. Yeah? So to the left, there will be small nuclei, and then as we go to the right, they will become larger and larger. So the first thing we will do, oh, now, yeah, before I do that, I need to also introduce a, uh, a, a unit of energy in nuclear physics, and the, the unit which we'll use here is the mega electron volt. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea for how big a mega electron volt is, if you drop a hair, which is about yeah, 10 to minus 7 kilograms, and you drop it by the thickness of one hair, you have just now liberated 3,000 MeV of energy. Yeah? Um, so now, usually it doesn't happen that if you drop a hair, you create a nuclear explosion, so why is that? Um, this is because in the nucleus, the energy is extremely concentrated. Yeah? But just to give you the scale, on a global scale, this energy is small. On a nuclear scale, it is actually quite large. So now, let's think about what makes the binding energy in such a nucleus? The first thing we notice, we said all these um, nuclei are densely packed. So if I densely pack a lot of spheres, this is now two-dimensional or three-dimensional, but you get the idea, you will always find the same number of nucleons around you. Yeah? So six in this case, six in this case, six in this case. Yeah? So that means we will have a term which essentially will be proportional to just the number of nucleons we have in the, in the nucleus. We call this the volume term. And when I divide the binding energy by the number of nucleons, what I get is that I get this constant term CV. But I've made a mistake now. Yeah, I've overcounted. Because there will be some, uh, some of the nucleons on the, on the outer edge, and those will not have six neighbors, but they only have four neighbors. Yeah? So I have to take something off now to compensate for that one. And this is proportional to the surface. And why this goes with a to the 2 over 3, you probably can figure out yourself if you just think about three minutes for, about it. And what this means is that now this binding energy per nuclear is dramatically reduced for very small nuclei. Why? Because the surface is very large compared to its volume. And the reduction is less important for larger nuclei. So the next term is... We said we have protons and nuclear, uh, neutrons inside the nucleus. Yeah? The protons are positively charged, and they electrostatically repulse each other. Yeah? So they will push out and will tend to, to, to break the, the nucleus apart. So this we account for with what we call the Coulomb term. Yeah? So the more protons there are in the, neutron, uh, in the nucleus, the more sort of this will tend to reduce the binding energy. Yeah? And, oops. And so this gives us now a, a reduction, particularly for large nuclei, where there are lots, lots of protons. So if we would stop here, the world would be a rather boring place, because then it would be very obvious that um, the, the energetically most favorable situation would be that we only have neutrons. Yeah? Then we don't have any Coulomb uh, repulsion. Everything is fine, yeah? um, which would be rather boring, because then we wouldn't be sitting here. No chemistry, no biology. So luckily, God has invented quantum mechanics, and there are two terms um, which now come from quantum mechanics, and we can't discuss the details here. But just to give you an idea, <coughs> the first one is what we call the asymmetry term. It turns out nature favors nuclei which have the same amount of neutrons and protons in it. Yeah, so in, in my little dummy uh, play nucleus here, I have, I think, nine protons and 10 neutrons. So that's about the same. Yeah? Um, and, and you can see that this is proportional to n minus z. So 
the more the difference, the bigger the difference between N and Z is, the bigger this reduction is. And then there's a final term, and that's called the, what we call the pairing term. It turns out in the nucleus, if you just look at protons, if you just look at neutrons, they like to pair, to, to pair up in pairs. Yeah? And so in my little dummy nucleus that works perfectly for the neutrons, they're all in pairs, and one odd proton is sticking out. Yeah? Uh, and so this gives us a, a last term, which is positive if I have even neutrons, even protons, negative if you have odd, odd, and zero if I'm in between. So this equation was developed by various peoples, but is commonly attributed to a German physicist von Weizsäcker um, in 1935. So you can see already, we're getting closer and closer to the timeline of the Oppenheimer movie. One thing which you can notice now, with all these various terms as they have uh, built up, is when we look at the resulting binding energy per nucleon, we see now that uh, it starts at very low values, and as the nuclei become bigger, it increases, and then there's a maximum where, about, where, where iron is. Yeah? Um, and so the biggest binding energy we will have in iron. And so that means in the long run, the expectation is this is the best bound nucleus, and this is where everything will go towards. Yeah? Now, if you have very large nuclei out here, we have uranium, and the uranium will now tend to, uranium is a very large nucleus, and energetically it's better for it to break up into smaller units, and this is what we call fission. This is what we are going to talk about today. So, let's look a little bit more into, into fission. It starts with a big nucleus, and that big nucleus will start to separate, and it will separate into two daughter nuclei. Yeah? The first thing we can notice, because you are now experts already in nuclear binding energy, what happens in the process is, at the beginning, the surface of the nucleus will increase. So you will get an increased reduction of the, of the binding energy due to the surface effect. So what this means is, at the beginning, I have to put energy in yeah, to start splitting, pulling apart the, the nucleons in the nucleus. But once I get to the point where you have now these two daughter uh, nuclei formed. Yeah, so for uranium, just to make this point, for uranium, that energy I have to put in is about 5 MeV. But once I've formed these two daughter nuclei and the surface is not increasing anymore, then I get a massive gain because now these two nuclei will electrostatically repulse each other. And so I get a lot of energy out from this uh, Coulomb force. So, what do we have to do to split the nucleus? Well, the first thing is we have to put a small amount of energy, 5 MeV, we have seen is a very small amount of energy, but we have to put it into a very tight uh, space. So, before I do that, I want to also explain uh, a little bit more about uranium. Yeah? Um, now, the, f the first thing here which we need to notice if we talk about uh, nuclei, that um, the the, the relevant parameter in terms of charge is the number of protons. That's what drives the chemistry of, of any element I make with these nuclei. But you could have a varying number of neutrons and would not affect the chemistry. And this indeed happens, and we call these um, nuclei with different number of neutrons, we call these isotopes. Because they're essentially in the same place in the, in the, um, in the period of uh, in, in the table of periodic table of elements. Now, uh, uranium. Uranium is a very dense metal. It's about 2.5 as dense as iron. Um, it's radioactive, but not very strongly, which means it actually um, survives for a very long time, and you can actually find it. You can dig it out of the ground. Um, usually, you can find it in, an, uh, in the form of an ore, which is called pitch blender. We know uranium for a long time, since the 18th century where a German uh, chemist has, uh, has the first, for the first time isolated it. And it's a good friend of the physicists because um, it was, for example, used by Becquerel, or let's say, Becquerel stumbled over a, a piece of uranium which exposed one of its photographic plates. Um, and this was our first indication that there's such a thing like radioactivity in, in nature. Now, the uranium nucleus has 92 protons. But it can have, it has several isotopes, and the most prominent ones are uh, one isotope which is 143 neutrons, and one which is 146 neutrons. And so there is two isotopes. One is called uranium-235. The number here is the 
is the atomic mass number, so the sum of the number of protons and, and neutrons, and then you have uranium-238 um, as the other isotope. If you dig out uh, natural uranium out of the ground, what you'll find is that it has 99.3% uranium-238 and about 0.7% of the uranium-235. So now we have seen we need to put a little bit of energy into uh, a nucleus to get a fission going. Um, so the question is now how can we transfer the energy into this nucleus? And a suitable vehicle is just use a neutron. Yeah? Shoot a neutron into the nucleus and that will give it now the energy to go above this fission barrier. So let's do that. Yeah? Let's start with uranium-238. Let's take a neutron, shoot a, a neutron into this uranium-238, and if the neutron is high energy, so let's say 6 MeV, then obviously energy conservation, the energy ends up in the nucleus, and that is enough to lift us over this barrier, and we will have induced a fission event. If, wouldn't, if our neutron wouldn't be so fast, it wouldn't have that energy, um, then it just wouldn't be insufficient to get us across this barrier. Yeah? So if I would shoot a neutron, a slower neutron, into uranium-238, it will not create fission, but essentially the uh, nucleus will de-excite by emission, emission of a photon. Now if we do the same game with uranium-235, something funny is happening. Because if I shoot now a low-energy neutron into uranium-235, something happens which shouldn't happen, yeah? namely you create fission. So what, hap what is happening? Ah, now the pesky little pairing term comes into play. Yeah? So what happens is the uranium-235 is a nucleus which has even set and odd end. So if you shoot another neutron into it, it, moves, it changes from an odd end <coughs> nucleus into an even end nucleus, and we have seen this gives us better binding energy. Yeah? And so that binding energy is now available. And it turns out it's good enough to kick now this uranium uh, nucleus over that fission barrier. And this is a general feature of nuclei which have an even number of Z and, uh, and an odd number of, of neutrons. Uh, we call these fissile. And another uh, example of this one is plutonium. We'll come back to that one in a moment. So, next slide, sorry, is slow. So, the, first, the next thing we want to no notice is when we look at nuclei, um, ah, of course, no. So this this is a graphic heavy this slide so that is slow. Yeah. So here we are. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm looking at um, nuclei in, in in the plane of n and z. Yeah. And we have seen before um, when we looked at the different contributions to the binding energy. There was this asymmetry term, and if I just would have the asymmetry term, it would tend to get the number of protons and neutrons to the same value. Yeah? So this would be the red line in that curve. However, it turns out, because of the Coulomb interaction, this curve, the, the curve the nuclei would really follow is now this green curve. And what you can see is that the, the larger nucleus becomes the more neutron rich it has to be. Yeah? The neutrons act as a glue, basically, to keep these positive charges which repel each other together. Yeah? Um, so uranium is out there, I've indicated it, and so now what happens if this uranium uh, uh, nuclear splits is it has a lot of neutrons which it requires because it's big, but it now splits into something which is smaller, so it now has too many neutrons. So what actually then happens is that some of those neutrons will just be spit out by that uh, fission process. So for uranium, there's typically about two to, four new, uh, two to three neutrons, as you can see. Yeah? So the uranium uh, nucleus receives a neutron. The, the neutron now brings it up to even, even, and then it breaks apart here into barium and krypton, and you have these three uh, individual uh, fission neutrons. Um, and also the daughter particle will subsequently decay by de de beta decay. Now this process, fission, was um, discovered by Hahn and Strassmann in 1938 and uh, explained by uh, Meitner and Fritsch. And when this was done, this was the start of the race. Yeah? This was the point where people 
started to see that this can lead to uh, a nuclear chain reaction. You know, because what happens now is in this fission process, you generate about 200 MeV. This predominantly goes into these two recoiling uh, daughter nu nu <coughs> nuclei because they repel each other because of the charge. Um, and you have these three neutrons. These three neutrons now, they get a small amount of energy because they're neutral. Yeah? Um, it's not enough to fission to uh, uranium-238, but it's enough to fission uranium-235. Yeah? And here is the starting point of the chain reaction. And this was something, an idea which was conceived by a, a, a Hungarian physicist, Szilard, in 1933, while he was crossing a, uh, a traffic light in London. Famous story. So, what are the challenges of building a bomb? The first one we said, this works with uranium-235, but not with 238, so we have to enrich the material. We have to basically remove all the uranium-238 so that we can only have 235 and we can do uh, this chain reaction. Um, so this is enrichment. Fantastically difficult, yeah, because uranium-235 and 238 really have nothing, not a lot, which distinguishes them. There's a small mass difference. So really what you have to do is you have to find physical processes how you can uh, separate these two slightly different uh, nuclei. So this was clearly a challenge for Manhattan Project. Three different approaches were taken. Gas diffusion, so you can uh, transfer, uh, uh, change uranium into a gas by combining it with uh, fluor, and you get your own hexafluoride. And uh, this gas diffuses through some barriers with a slightly different speed uh, for the two isotopes. Next one was electromagnetic separation. You can use the fact that the nuclei have a slightly different inertia, and so you can uh, accelerate them and, and then look at the uh, at the slightly different inertia in this uh, acceleration. And the last one they used is liquid thermal diffusion. Um, when you have a mixture of two gases which passes through a temperature gradient, the heavier gas tends to concentrate at the cold end and the lighter gas at the warm end. Fantastically difficult, and I will show you in a moment how difficult or how big this was. Uh, none of them was easy in the end. They used all three technologies sequentially. But before I go to, uh, to showing you the facilities, a word about plutonium. We said this is also a fissile uh, material. It doesn't exist in nature. It decays too quickly. So, but you can pro produce uranium in a, in a reactor um, by uh, absorbing a neutron with a 238 uh, uranium, and then you have two beta decays, and then you end up with this fissile plutonium. Highly radioactive and toxic. It's a really, really nasty material, in, apart from that you can use it to build a bomb. Yeah? Um, and... Uh, was first produced in 1940. Yeah, so we are now already in the middle of, of, of the discussion of, of, of the Oppenheimer movie. Uh, one key milestone in the Manhattan Project was, therefore, that they could build the first uh, controlled chain reaction in a, in a reactor, and this was uh, uh, at the Chicago Pile 1, the first uh, nuclear reactor in the, in the history of mankind. And this was December 1942. And then for the production, new reactors were built. One of the first one, which may produce plutonium in any sizable amount, was a, a reactor in Oak Ridge. And then the plutonium for the Trinity bomb and the Fat Man bomb um, was produced in Hanford. Now, one problem with plutonium is that uh, this uranium-239, which is fissile, is often contaminated with another is isotope from, of, um, of plutonium, which is 240, has one more neutron and therefore has a tendency to spontaneously fission. And that's a problem when you build a bomb. <laughs> we'll come to this one in a moment. Um, and the other thing is actually plutonium is a nasty material. It's also quite difficult to handle the metallurgy. So just to give you now an indication of the effort which were involved in this Manhattan Project, um, Manhattan Project uh, comprised facilities all over the US. Um, the, the, the first sort of cluster of important uh, facilities was at Oak Ridge, because here is where the uranium enrichment take, took place. And so this was the uh, S50, was the plant where liquid, um, or the thermal diffusion was performed, um, which was the first stage of the enrichment process. Then it was sent to the gas diffusion plant. This is K25. Yeah? And this is an absolutely enormous beast. This was the largest building in the whole world at the time. Yeah? Biggest floor space which ever has 
has, has existed in, in the building. You can see 800 meters long. Yeah? It would take you about 10 minutes to walk from one end to the other. And then finally, you have the electromagnetic separation in a facility which is called Y12. All of those were located in Oak Ridge in Tennessee. So this is for the uranium enrichment. Um, where do we get the plutonium from? The, we said the plutonium is reactor bred. So they built three reactors for plutonium brooding, and those were in, uh, in Hanford. So this is Washington State. And, but this is only the first step, because then you have to separate the plutonium from the, the rest of the, of the nuclear core. So you also need a chemical separation plant. And there were three of them, uh, each of them 250 meters long which was about the size of the Queen Mary ocean liner at the time. So that's why they were called Queen Marys. Yeah. Um, the, the whole of Manhattan Project employed nearly 130,000 people at its peak, and not physicists, absolutely not, no construction workers who had to build all these facilities. Um, cost at the time two uh, billion US dollars, and this is in the time of a, of a, of a global war with, with its commitments. Um, equivalent to about 24 billion today. So 90% of the effort of Manhattan Project was not in Los Alamos, was not in what we have seen in the, in the uh, Oppenheimer movie, but were these facilities all over the US. Only less than 10% was actually then spent in Los Alamos. So next critical question is, how much of that stuff do we need? Yeah? And this is actually still from the movie. You might, when you have seen the movie, you might have remembered this one scene where he throws these glass marbles into these balls. You might have asked yourself, why is that? Is it just play? Like, does he like to play marbles? No, no, no. There's a meaning. You need to have a minimum amount of fissile material to make this work. If you don't, then as you see here in the small ball here, you, have, you start a fission reaction, but all these new, uh, precious neutrons which you produce in this fission reaction, they just go out of the surface of the material, it's lost, no chain reaction. So you need a minimum size for it. The bare sphere critical mass at normal density for your uranium-235 is 52 kilograms, a sphere of 17 centimeters, so this is what in the movie was the big ball. And for plutonium, it's much less, it's about 10 kilograms, just much smaller. Um, the first estimates for the critical mass uh, for these fissile materials, or actually for uranium-235, was done in Britain in 1933 by Frisch and Piles. And Piles has a connection to this, to this uh, university, this department here. Obviously, these calculations are very difficult, so it had to be backed up by experiments. And these were the, the places of the first radiation um, accidents in history. Now, how does the blast develop? Uh, after 80 generations of chain reaction, uh, and this occurs in less than a microsecond, to give you a feeling, the blink of an eye is about 350,000 microseconds. So at a much, much shorter time scale uh, than, the, uh, than a blink of an eye, we go through 80 generations of this, uh, of this chain reaction. What does this do? After 80 generations, I get 10 to the 24 uh, fission events. Yeah, so this is, you, you might know this story with the, this Indian story with the rice corn and the, and the chessboard. And you get every time, it's just the powers of two. Yeah? So if you have 80 uh, powers of two, that's a, bar, a big number and becomes macroscopic. Yeah? It involves now half a kilogram of fissile material at this point. The energy released, so we just take now these 10 to the 24 fission events, multiply it with the 200 MeV we get out of a single fission event, yeah, which was very small, but now we have so many of those, um, gives us 40 terajoule. Um, which is equivalent to the uh, explosive power of 10 kilotons of TNT. Yeah? So we are here now at the bomb level. The energy goes mostly into kinetic energy of the daughter nuclei, and uh, because the material is so dense, they will bump into other nuclei, and essentially this whole energy will go into heat. But heat doesn't flow very quickly. So that heat gets stuck in that, in that uh, heavy core. Yeah? And, and, and so what happens now is because you create so much heat in that heavy core is this drives up the temperature to enormous values, yeah? to uh, tens of millions of degrees C. Yeah? This is hotter than the temperature of the outside of the sun. It's like the temperature of the sun in, in its core itself. Yeah? It's not stable. It just stays for a very, very short time, but it's an enormous temperature. And if something has such an enormous amount of temperature, 
what it does, it, it releases its energies, but now by shooting out photons, X-ray photons. And those X-ray photons will hit now other material, and when it, it, because there are so many, they have such a high energy, they basically vaporize the material around it. And from that vaporization, you get a shock wave. So how did this look like? So this is a picture actually still from the Trinity explosion after 1 40th of a second. This um, blast wave has uh, now achieved a diameter of about 200, 300 meters. And you can see this well, nicely defined uh, shock wave from this blast, which has been produced by the vaporization of the, of the material by the X-rays. Or you can also find videos on YouTube on some of some other tests with about a similar yield, but uh, now a thermonuclear weapon, which is a completely different story. But the basic thing is the same. You get a very quick release of a lot of energy in a small volume, and this produces these type of shock waves. Main effects of the nuclear bomb are 50% of the energy go into the blast, 35 into thermal energy, prompt ionizing radi radiation 5%, and delayed ionizing radi uh, radiation is 10%. So, what was the last uh, big challenge for building the bomb is actually how you fire it up. Um, before you ignite the bomb, what you want is you don't want the bomb to explode when you carry it in the, in, in the airplane to the place where you want to use it. So what you do is you separate the material into smaller pieces which are all below critical. And then when you fire the bomb, you, you unite them into a supercritical mass and then hopefully if, if your bomb works, this is where, 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 where the chain reaction takes place. Now the problem here is, the technical problem is that if, this, uh, if, 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 if the chain reaction starts, that immediately releases a lot of energy and the material starts to separate already during that process. Um, so you need to keep the materials sufficiently long together that a full-blown chain reaction takes place. If you don't manage this, you get a fizzle. But even in a bomb which does work reasonably well, only a fraction of the material actually has time to, uh, to, to, be, uh, to be part of the chain reaction. So in Trinity, in Trinity bomb, there were six kilograms of plutonium and one kilogram of uh, uh, fission. So the simplest thing how you can do that is now you can use a gun type bomb, um, which is suitable for two, three, uh, uranium 235 only, because it's actually too slow for plutonium. Um, conceptually and technically rather simple, therefore not considered a challenge by the physicists in Los Alamos. Um, but has one drawback that it requires a lot of highly valuable enriched uranium 235. And it's also not very efficient. That bomb had about 64 kilo of, um, of fissile material, and only one kilogram was used. But unfortunately, it was indeed used, uh, and it was used for the Hiroshima bomb. For plutonium, the thing is much more complicated. We have seen is this, this pesky uh, uh, plutonium 240, which tends to sort of uh, induce uh, fission too quickly, too, too early, yeah? and you would run a risk that your bomb blows up or fizzles uh, before you want to use it. Yeah? So they had to find a more clever uh, uh, approach, and this was used in the Trinity test and also in the bomb used then on Batman. And the idea is basically you have now a, a spherical assembly with the, the fissile material in the center, and you um, have a, a conventional uh, explosive which surrounds that one and that drives a shock wave to the center compresses the core, um, and this compression now reduces the reduced mass, and that is then what, uh, what makes the whole thing uh, supercritical. Now, this is technically difficult. It's not difficult because it's difficult uh, uh, particle, uh, nuclear physics. This is difficult because it's chemistry and explosive technology. Yeah? Um, and this is what a lot of time was uh, spent on in Los Alamos, to get this right. Yeah? Um, yeah, you don't only have uh, the, the, the fissile core here, you also use actually a very heavy metal, and they had lots of uranium lying around, so they could use that one to sort of drive that explosion and keep it long enough together because of this very massive material. This is what we call a tamper. Now, as we have seen, the, the required um, critical mass for plutonium is not a lot. Six kilograms is enough, something of that size. But what makes the whole thing big is now this arrangement of the temper around it and then the explosive and, 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 and the firing mechanism and all these things. So this is a picture of the Trinity device 
You can see it's about two meters in diameter. Why is it so big? Well, because of all these additional features. The actual fissile core was not bigger than a grapefruit. Nevertheless, this became then the, the, the standard uh, fundamental uh, geometry for, for all other nuclear bombs which have been built uh, after that one. Yeah? And the, the challenge then was basically to make this two meter device smaller so that we can easy, more easily place it on, on other delivery vehicles. So, my last slide now. Um, you have seen, when you have watched Oppenheimer, there was a huge motivation for the physicists working on that project because they were afraid that Hitler would get his nuclear bomb first. You have also seen that quite a lot of the nuclear physics was actually driven by German physicists, so this uh, fear was not totally unwarranted. Um, but what has happened is that a lot of the very capable physicists uh, were pushed out of, of Germany, moved to uh, the US, and became part of the Manhattan Project. Now, there have been a few uh, people who stayed be behind. Heisenberg, you probably know. Weizsäcker, you have seen, he, he was involved in the in this uh, in, uh, binding energy formula. Hahn, who found uh, um, uh, fission in, in, in uranium. So they stayed on. And they did work on uh, a German nuclear program. Um, even though the regime was not particularly friendly to uh, modern physics concepts, there were a lot of sort of niches where these people could get money uh, from, and the army actually was supporting this to some extent. So um, why did this effort never go anywhere? Well, the first one is um, too many of the, of the good physicists have left the country. The group which was left in Germany was just not big enough. And not only was it not big enough, um, also, quite a few of them he hated each other's guts, yeah? and so <laughs> they were not capable of working together. Uh, very, very, very different than the spirit which, which, which happened in Los Alamos, as you might have seen in the movie. Um, now, the next thing is, fundamentally, the German physicists did not believe that a bomb would be possible on the time scale of, of, of the World War. Um, this is partially caused because they made several mistakes. The first one is they overestimated the, the, um, the critical mass required for such a bomb. You know, they never did a proper calculation. They didn't have friction piles. Um, the second misconception that they had is they didn't think that a graphite reactor would be possible like uh, the graphite reactor which Fermi has built in, in Chicago in 1942. So they were bound to, to work with, with a, another material which is called heavy water. So their focus was therefore not on building a bomb, but what they wanted to achieve was uh, achieving a sustained chain reaction. And, 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 and they basically wanted to sell this to the army as a, as a good source of, of, of energy. Yeah. Um, so um, that's what was their, their goal. They tried until the last days of the war, they tried to achieve that, but failed. Part of the reason why they failed is because due to the effort of several players all over the world, um, access to the key materials, uranium and heavy water, was, uh, was, uh, was limited or interrupted. And ultimately, the regime was never prepared to divert the industrial capacity, which we've seen is enormous, um, um, uh, to, to that type of effort. And they rather preferred to, to pull, pull that amount of effort into other weapons they thought are more promising. Now, my personal opinion is that by late 1943, it should have been amply clear that the Germans were not on the route to such, uh, to such a, a, a weapon, um, just because they would have seen if such large facilities would have been around. And by autumn of 1944, it was totally clear, because by that time, the Allies had reached the Rhine, um, and the, uh, with no sign that anything like this happened. And they actually even had a measurement where they uh, flew uh, planes which were looking for xenon-133, which is a, an isotope which is emitted in nuclear reactions uh, over Germany, and they couldn't find the signal, so this was evidence that no chain reaction had taken place in Germany. So, summary. Uh, key points. The release of nuclear energy, the energy in the bomb, is caused by an increase in nuclear binding energy, and for large nuclei, this is achieved by reducing the size, by splitting it. Um, the split rarely happens spontaneously, but you have to put some energy in to overcome this fission barrier, and that can come from a neutron. 
Fissile materials can be split by low energy neutrons. Why? Because you get the energy from the pairing term. And so the key thing is now that you have to uh, isolate that fissile material, either uranium-235 or plutonium. Um, the daughter nuclei retain the high fraction of neutrons, and so this gives us these uh, additional neutrons, and these neutrons then uh, can sustain the chain reaction. For a functioning bomb, the fissile material, which is kept separately in parts, um, has to be uh, united very, very quickly and has to be kept together uh, for enough time to, for this chain reaction to develop. And the production of the required pure fissile material is an industrial operation. Yeah, um, and it's also, it's, it's difficult not so much from the nuclear physics part of view, but uh, there's difficult pathology, um, there is difficult uh, uh, the, the combination of these, of these subcritical parts by the explosions is very, very difficult. Uh, so there were technical challenges which were not necessarily nuclear, but, uh, but still very, very difficult. And this is what the movie is about. This is what happened in Los Alamos, where they tried to come to grips with those technical issues. Thank you.